the Southern Ohio Farm Show. This is Gigi Neal of OSU Extension in Claremont County, Agricultural and Natural Resources Educator. Well, I'm James Morris, the Agricultural and Natural Resources and Community Development Educator for the Ohio State University Extension in Brown County. And I'm Brooke Beam, the Ohio State University Extension Educator for Agriculture, Natural Resources, and Community Development in Highland County. And we will be your hosts for the Southern Ohio Farm Show. I am strong at heart for my son, Jackson Britton, who was born with a congenital heart defect. It's something that he will have for the rest of his life. So he will always have heart checkups and have to be heart healthy. Thank you. My name is Jacoby and I'm strong at heart. I've had two heart surgeries and they were two years apart and the symptoms weren't similar. So you really need to pay attention to what your body's telling you and get your annual checkups like your doctor tells you. Thank you. I'm Misty Harmon and I'm strong at heart. These are my uncles and down here is my dad. All of them had heart disease and all of them did things throughout their life to try to manage that heart disease. My dad is still alive today and he continues to take care of himself and do things to stay heart strong. In addition to my uncles and my dad, these three right here, they're my other reason for being strong at heart. Thank you. My name is Dan Remley and I am strong at heart. I live with type one diabetes and I try to keep my blood sugar under control. I exercise almost every day. I eat healthy, lots of fruits and vegetables. I wanna stay strong at heart so I can play tennis in my old age and go for hikes and see my kids grow up and that type of thing. Thanks. Hi, my name is Candace. I am strong at heart because my mild sleep apnea and abnormal heart rhythm puts me at a higher risk for having issues with my heart. Throughout the past two decades, I have learned to focus on quality sleep and following through with my medical appointments for my overall health and well-being. Join us for the Strong at Heart, Live Healthy, Live Well email challenge. Hi, and welcome to Scioto Trail State Forest. Today I'd like to introduce you to red mulberry. Red mulberry is a native tree usually not a very large tree. It typically grows in the understory of a forest or along a forest edge, but rarely do you see it up into the canopy of a forest. It's much less common than its non-native cousin, the white mulberry, and many people don't recognize it when they see it in the woods. Um, what's unique about red mulberry are the leaves. With white mulberry, you're gonna see leaves that have really deep cut sinuses or gaps between the lobes. With red mulberry, you might not see lobes. In fact, a lot of the leaves don't have lobes. So these are simple leaves. They can be, according to the keys, four to six inches in length. I've seen them much larger than that, probably pushing a foot, especially when growing in very shaded conditions. But a lot of times they won't have the extra lobes. If you do look on a lot of the trees, you're gonna find multiple lobes. Here's an example of one with three tips, and they can have up to five tips or five separate lobes, or they may have a single lobe. And that's pretty common to have a single lobe. They tend to be a little bit dull on the surface where the non-native white mulberry tends to be glossy. Again, these things are simple. They have a serrated or toothed margin or edge. They are alternate. So the leaves alternate sides and therefore the buds alternate sides. But again, they're pretty dull. They're not gonna be glossy like the white mulberry, which is in fact, more common than the red mulberry. You typically see it in disturbed areas, urban areas, uh, along railroad tracks and things like that, woodland edges near urban areas. One thing a lot of people confuse this tree with is basswood or tilia. Tilia americana is the most common one down here. And the leaves do look pretty similar. Uh, basswood leaves tend to be a little bit more uniform in size and typically aren't much bigger than this one where uh, red mulberry leaves can be much larger. Um, also with basswood you're going to typically see lobes. They tend to be unequal at the base and you're going to have more lobing at the base so they tend to be more heart-shaped 
then this one's more of an oval shape. When we zoom in and really look at the buds on uh, basswood and on mulberry, one of the big differences is the number of exposed bud scales. With basswood, you're gonna see two visible bud scales. You're gonna have one that kind of covers part of the bud, another one that wraps around it. And that's very typical for basswood. It's, buds will tend to be green on basswood and maybe turn to a reddish color in the fall. With the mulberries, they're gonna have multiple exposed bud scales. And the keys say four to eight. So it's very unusual to find four. Usually they got more than that. So you really zoom in at this bud and look at it closely. You're gonna see multiple bud scales. Again, it alternates side. Small tree tends to not grow upright. It tends to be kind of straggly and spread out. Uh, the bark on it on this one looks a lot like red bud bark, but as it gets a little bigger, you're gonna see some shredding, shreddiness to it. It's gonna to start to split and more shreds vertical. But again, this is red mulberry. And of course it's named for the fruit it produces. It produces a reddish or blackish fruit that is great for wildlife. Its cousin, the white mulberry, can actually have white fruit on it as well, but it'll have reddish fruit too. But again, this is red mulberry, one of our native small trees. Thank you and be sure to enjoy part of your day in the woods. Good morning, my name is Chris Brunus <clears throat> with Ohio State University Extension in Ross County. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about the Farm Bill decision. We're going to go over the three choices that we have and then next week if you join me again I'll do a case farm and I'll play out scenarios under each of the decisions uh, to see what that might look like going forward uh, into the future. And so this decision needs to be made uh, soon. Uh, today we're going to cover a few, uh, a few different things, dates and deadlines, uh, what we need to do as farmers and producers. Uh, we'll also talk about each of the farm program characteristics, what they do, what they don't do, uh, how their payments are calculated. So we have a little bit of an understanding on what's happening uh, under each of the programs. And then finally, we're gonna talk about making a decision but that'll be pushed to next week when we talk about a case farm. So let's go with the reminders first. Uh, the last time we had to sign up, we signed up for two years, 2019 and 2020. And if you remember, we did that about a year ago. And so we already knew 19 and we had a pretty good handle on, on what might happen in 20. But now we're gonna do that annually. And we have two things that we need to do. We need to enroll and we need to elect. Now, if we don't make a different election, whatever we elected last time just rolls forward, but we still need to go in and sign up and enroll. The last time I talked to my FSA director in Ross County, she said only about 10% of the farms have been enrolled for 2021. So don't forget to get in there and do that before March 15th. But as you enroll, you also have the option to make a different election if you don't wanna stay with the same program that you had the last time. Now, just a, a note here, the service centers are open for business, but there's not gonna be any walk-in appointments, so you just can't show up and walk in. Uh, make sure you call ahead, schedule an appointment. Much of this can be done uh, via the internet, and so you may not even have to go in at all, uh, especially since uh, FSA uh, employees are not permitted to advise you on which program to enroll in. They're simply there to make the transaction happen, not to provide advice. So what are our decisions? When we come back this last farm bill, again, this decision, we have to make it here before March of 15th, 2021. Uh, we have the agricultural risk coverage or ARC County. Uh, it's based on 85% of base acres. And then we have the agricultural risk coverage, which is an individual coverage, and that's based on 65% of a farm's base acres. So the payment would be on less base acres, but it could be bigger depending on that farm. And then we have the price loss coverage, again, paid on 85% of the base acres and the base yields that are determined where the agriculture risk coverage programs are based on the county one, the county average, an individual one on that particular farm's average. Also, there is a, a combo product called supplemental crop insurance. Your insurance agent may talk to you about that. 
uh, it can be purchased on planted acres, but only if those farms are signed up in the price loss coverage. And we'll look at that uh, a little bit later to see if that is an attractive option or not. So first let's talk about price loss coverage. Again, there is a payment made when the market year average price falls below the calculated effective reference price. And the reference price simply is a price that the government has set for corn that's $3.70. It's been that for some time now. Soybeans $8.40, wheat $5.50, and you can read the rest on the screen there. Uh, the payment rate is then multiplied by your individual farm yield to generate a payment. And so let's say we have a 120 acre farm, we have 100 acres of base, and of that 100 acres of base, 40 acres is corn. And let's say that the base yield, I'm just picking numbers that are easy to multiply, is 100. And let's say we have an market year average price of 370. Uh, zero times anything is zero, there would not be a payment. If we go to 360, we would get a dime. Dime times the 40 acres times the 100 bushel, then times 85% of that to get that reduction. And then let's think about what the market year average price is again. It is the national price of the grain sold during the months of that, of that market year. And so for 2021, our market year will start September 1 of 2021. So if we wanna guess the market year average price, whether it's gonna be above or below the effective reference prices, we have to guess what we think the average price of crops sold between March or September 1st, 2021 and August 31st of 2022. So that's a ways out in the future. The best guess we have right now is just to look at what is the harvest price that we can that, that we can get corn for. And as of yesterday, that was 455 on corn, 1306 on beans and 630 on wheat. Those numbers are clearly all, all above this reference price. Now, whether they'll stay there throughout the marketing year is yet to be seen, but if we're locking in prices for harvest delivery or even further into the future, that's the price that we're selling that grain at, that will go into that calculation at some point in the future. So that's PLC, it's pretty straightforward. It is a price loss coverage has nothing to do with revenue. If we have great yields, if we have low yields, if we don't even plant corn and we put the whole farm in soybeans, we would still be eligible for a corn payment. Now let's talk about our county. Again, this is a green county example, uh, compliments of Ben Brown, and it's going to compare actual revenue to the guarantee. And we can see going back to 2014 through 2020, and then that red uh, a dotted bar there is the anticipated revenue for 2020. Again, it doesn't look like Art County is going to make a payment in Greene County for 2020. Now, it did make a payment in some counties for 2019. I live in Ross County. My Ross County farmers did not get an Art County payment in 2020 or 2019 that would have arrived uh, in the fall of 2020. And so if we look back, history can tell us a little bit, but it's not a very good predictor either. And so if we look at 2021, what is that guarantee payment or that, that, that average revenue that we need to fall below before it makes a payment? Well, each county will be slightly different, but for Greene County, it's 645.98 on corn. And so if we take our corn yield times the market year average price, again, thinking about between September 1 of 2021 to August 31st of 2022, what that average price is times our county average yield. If that number falls below uh, 645 on corn, 461 on soybeans, 367 on wheat, then we would get a payment based on 85% of our base acres. Again, it's not based on planted acres, it's based on those base acres. And again, these are county yields, not individual yields. And again, I know that every county has slightly different, I think corn in Ross County was 621. So again, there's $24, $25 difference. And we'll see that variation across the state based on 
the productivity of that county and what that average yield in that county is over time. So that is our county. We have to fall below a revenue. So this can be driven both by low prices and or low yields and or both. And so if we're concerned about low revenue, this could provide a payment. And so again, there, there we can look at what years the payments were triggered and what years they weren't. And again, if you look at 2017, I would say that was a very small payment. So let's, let's talk about ARC individual. It's a completely different uh, animal uh, than we're used to. Its concept is very similar, but instead of using county yields, it is going to use farm yields, your individual farm yields. And so there's three major differences. It's gonna be for all commodities. For our PLC in our county, we can sign corn, soybeans, wheat, whatever commodities we're growing up for a different farm program. They don't have to be in the same one, but if we elect our individual, all the commodities or all the crops being grown on that FSA farm number must be in this farm program. So again, it's, it's a little bit different. That's one. Number two, we're going to use actual planting. So this will come closer to covering what you're planting. So if I plant the whole farm to corn, it's going to look at your corn yield, corn price against that revenue. But instead of being paid on 85% of those base acres, when I go back to my example farm, and I said we had 40, ac 40 acres of base, that doesn't matter. What we'll have is 100 acres of corn base now because we planted the whole farm to corn and we'll be paid on 65 of those 100 acres if there is a payment. So it's a little bit different. It's a little bit more complicated. Uh, and there are some scenarios that we think farmers need to look at this. And again, we've come up with four ideas. Uh, if we had a lot of preventative plant on any acres, and again, we learned this uh, because there was areas in the state in 2019 that had huge areas of preventative plant and that made a huge payment for 2019 that they received in 2020. Uh, and then if we have farm yields 15% below the historical five year FSA farm average of all crops, uh, it looks to pay. And so you know, we're talking about a 15% yield hit. Uh, and so what farms might have a 15% yield hit? Those would be those uh, river bottoms that flood out. And so they're kind of a feast or famine. Uh, if it's a famine year and, and you happen to be in here, you probably could get a pretty good payment. If it's a feast year and we have low prices, uh, it's not going to pay you anything because it's probably not going to be enough to offset the, the low yields as well. And then large fruit and vegetable acreages, we feel uh, if more than 15% of your farm is in fruit and vegetables, we feel that this takes a, a good look at this program to make sure it's something that would work for you. So if we kind of compare these programs, we have uh, uh, PLC, price loss coverage, crop by crop basis, 85% of base acres, no requirement to plant a covered commodity, and then SCO is available. And again, talk with your crop insurance about that. Uh, you know, if you're a low insurance uh, purchaser, 70, 75%, uh, the cost of SEO is relatively inexpensive, and it can get you up to 86%. Just realize that it's not individual, it's county coverage. And so you're kind of blending those, but it could make sense on many farms, uh, especially if your farm yields track with the county averages. And then we have our county election made crop by crop again, 85% of base acres. Again, no requirement to plant a covered commodity because it's based on base acres and base, uh, base yields. And then ARC IC, the election is made on a farm by farm basis. So I don't have to do all of my farms. I can pick a farm and put in ARC IC. Payments will be made on 65% of the base acres. So we get that hit there. But again, it's more individualized coverage towards my specific farming operation. And then we have to plant a covered commodity uh, on that farm to receive a payment. And so payments are based on the county where the base acres are physically located. So if I'm farming in multiple counties, a uh, payment rate in one county for any of these programs may be different than that payment rate uh, on, in another county having the same price and yield declines. 
And so if we want to look back just real quick, what did people do last time? Uh, we did a survey at the end of our producer meetings and it was interesting to kind of see what we had. These aren't scientific or, or uh, publishable, but uh, what did people do? Well, revenue and price expectations and profit maximization seem to be the driving decision factor over risk management. And so uh, with 2019 having the biggest influence and knowing the outcome of our decision for 2019, most farmers picked the one that created the largest payment. And then producers with higher levels of crop insurance tended to go with the ARC IC or ARC County over PLC uh, because they didn't need the SCO basically and weren't uh, getting much benefit out of the SCO. So there was no reason to look at PLC. Uh, ARC IC was uh, a huge deterrent. People didn't go into that because of the individual record keeping and reporting that's required with that. And also uh, PLC payments for corn and wheat looked pretty attractive at the time. And so people weren't willing to give those up for a potential payment under ARC IC. And then finally, producers who indicated that they didn't know which programs to choose, just went for the simpler program and said, you know what, I'll take PLC, I'll let crop insurance do my revenue protection and life goes on. So it's the best decision for 2021. I think that depends on your uh, objective, uh, whether you're wanting to maximize farm program revenue or whether you wanna minimize the risk exposure on your farm. I'm gonna tell you, join me next week. I will examine a case farm and look at the potential returns to each decision and then some additional information that may make making the decision a little bit more uh, easier for you. So until that, we'll see you next week.